at the end. Uh, it's one thing to share content and have people agree with you, but I really believe it's when there's disagreements and misunderstandings that, that we can learn the most. So if there's anything that you disagree with us on, I encourage you to uh, bring that to a question at the end, to bring that to the discussion. Look forward to that interaction as well. And uh, we are, of course, both available uh, offline to further the conversations. So with that, uh, I'd like to get started and talk to you about airflow management and the basics of that. Every computer room in the world can be placed in one of two categories, those without IT equipment intake air temperature problems or those with IT equipment intake air temperature problems. And the definition of a problem is whether or not the intake temperatures meet the desired range as established by the site, or if the site hasn't established a range, it's, you know, as ASHRAE defines that range. And that's really what's most important. That's, uh, that's why a computer room exists. One of the three primary reasons a computer room exists is to provide continuous cooling, continuous uh, connectivity, and connect continuous power. And Airflow management is fundamental to the process of optimizing the computer room because if a room has uh, intake temperature problems, then obviously you want to improve that condition to improve the reliability of the equipment. And if there are no problems, then there's quite likely an opportunity to improve the efficiency of the, uh, the cooling in the room. So I'm sure all of you, or most all of you, are familiar with the term PUE. PUE stands for Power Usage Effectiveness, and it's a very simple metric to calculate. It's simply the total load of the entire data center divided by the IT load. And we can see here that if you look at the mechanical cooling and the cooling fans, uh, they represent 30% 35% of, uh, of the total load, and 73% of the non-IT load. So that's in strong comparison to electrical losses being only 10%. You know, there's a lot of effort being made in the world these days to improve the efficiency of, of the infrastructure and data centers. And you know, while looking at a UPS efficiency or some other electrical component is, is probably is a good idea and there may be a very strong ROI associated with those improvements. It has a relatively small effect on the, the total, uh, total equation. Really where the greatest point of leverage is, is in improving the cooling of the data center. And airflow management stands as the prerequisite uh, to improving cooling. So one of the most fundamental concepts is the concept of bypass airflow. It's widely, under, it's widely known, but it's, it's not widely understood. The definition is simply any air that comes out of a cooling unit that does not pass through IT equipment before returning to a cooling unit is bypass airflow. Where the confusion comes in is that a lot of people think that by installing a blanking panel or sealing a cable opening, that they're affecting the bypass airflow. Uh, that might be true at the rack level, but it's not true at the room level. The calculation for bypass airflow is, is simply taking the total CFM of all the conditioned air moving through all the cooling units, subtracting the amount of air moving through the IT equipment, and you have what's left over is bypass airflow. And this is fundamental to improving the airflow management in the room and optimizing the infrastructure. Right-sizing the cooling, as it were, um, is to match as closely as possible the amount of air moving through the cooling units to the amount of air moving through the IT equipment. And the better airflow management is done, the better uh, that can be done, the closer those two flow rates can be. Another element to this that's really important is to recognize that the amount of air moving through IT equipment varies depending upon the amount of load that that IT equipment is consuming and, of course, the 
delta T through that IT equipment. So this chart shows that if the delta T through the IT equipment is 15 degrees, then that IT equipment will be consuming 211 CFM to cool a single kilowatt. Whereas more modern equipment is being designed with a higher delta T, you know, example there at the other end of the chart of 40 degree delta T through the IT equipment is only going to require 79 CFM to keep a cool uh, kilowatt cool. So this can have a, a big effect on what's the total flow rate of cooling required in the room and how to balance the flow rate of uh, conditioned air at the room level, at the aisle level, and ultimately uh, in some cases you may need to consider it at the rack level. So these next three graphics are a way to show how bypass airflow uh, relates to improving airflow management through the raised floor. So here's a typical scenario where we have 10 units of air moving through all the cooling units in the room. This, this one cooling unit in the right-hand corner uh, represents all the cooling units in the room. And so 10 units of air is moving through all the cooling units. And if 10 goes under the floor, then 10 will come out of the floor. And in this case, we have four coming out of supply tiles in the cold aisle and six units of air coming out of unsealed cable openings behind cabinets. So we see this situation in a lot of rooms, and a lot of people uh, start to look at airflow management. And they say, OK, well, I need to seal those, those cable openings. And when I do, I'm going to improve the bypass airflow. Well, it does help. It's the right thing to do. But it doesn't change the amount of bypass airflow in the room. It directs all the air to the supply tiles in the cold aisle. And now 10 units of air is going to be coming out of all the supply tiles in the cold aisles. But the IT equipment is only going to still continue to need a total of four units of air. You see two in each, each of these rows is how much air the IT equipment is needed. So two, uh, four gets pulled out of that 10, delivered to the aisle. And there's six units of air left unneeded in that aisle, and so it returns back to the cooling units as bypass airflow. So the opportunity created by improving the cable openings is to reduce the amount of air moving through all the cooling units and right-sizing or more closely matching the supply to the demand. So airflow management can become a little bit complex. And it's quite often that somebody has addressed one area of airflow management, one aspect, but not addressed another or not reaped the benefits of it. So to address that, we've developed this concept, this protocol of the four R's of airflow management. It's a holistic approach that recognizes the, recognizes the iterative nature of airflow management and provides guidance so that you can on improving airflow management at each of these three levels represented by the circle around the room. And then once you've improved airflow management at, say, the rack level, you can go to the room level and check in and, and see what benefits are able to be, to be realized. And we have other content on this. There's a link there to a video describing this in more detail. And uh, there's other ways uh, for us to share more detail about this. But the way we're going to do that today is, is I'm not going to hand the presentation to Mark Seymour. And he's going to use engineering simulation to show how improving airflow management at various levels of the room has sometimes some undesired consequences and, and what we can learn from that. So Mark, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Lars, for that introduction. Uh, I think it set the scene really well. Uh, and interestingly, Lars talked about the need to set, set things right in the rack and the room. And so we're going to see some of that today. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'd like to cover here is why considering airflow is important. Lars has touched on that a little already. Um, but it is vitally important. And it's also vitally important that we use good practice. Uh, good practice provides us with a tool to improve the airflow, but it's not a guarantee. We have to apply that good practice throughout the uh, data center. And, and you'll, you'll see that in some of the uh, simulations I show. Engineering simulation is, is, a, is a useful tool to illustrate the airflow 
and it helps us to be proactive um, by uh, testing the installation before we actually deploy. Um, and as we've said, we must apply this to both rack and cabinet level, as well as the room. Next, please. Right, so just touching on what uh, Lars talked about in terms of bypass, obviously a key issue. We're trying to match cooling airflow to, between the cooling supply and the, and, and the rack. But there are a few other things that can go wrong and undermine even that perfect performance whereby uh, the IT just takes all its air from the cool air in the room. So we can get negative flow, uh, in this case uh, through the raised floor, through the tile near the cooling unit, common place for it to occur, but equally it can occur in any other form of containment, like containment in the aisle or um, containment division between the front and the back of the rack. So we want to avoid hot air going back into the cold air stream, that's negative flow. We want to avoid bypass, as Lars mentioned, and we also want to avoid recirculation, that is um, hot air um, going back into the cold air stream in the, in the room. Okay, next please. So let's look at one of the most uh, common methods of management, very important technology, uh, managing leakage through cable penetrations. Typically cable penetrations are unmanaged in legacy data centers, so the first thing to do is to think about managing them. They're typically installed in the raised floor in the rear of a cabinet, so if there is leakage, the cold air leaks straight into the hot side of the, cooling, uh, of the rack, not doing any work, bypassing. We can install cable management, it's an easy win, but we sometimes have to take care. It's worth noting that, that, that cable management uh, and leakage management is appropriate for the room and for the rack. And if you look at the bullets on the right hand side, you'll see that they're very similar. We're doing the same things in the cabinet in the room, trying to prevent cold air getting into the hot side and vice versa. Next please. So why should we install cable penetration management? Well, we want to stop the cold air leaking, as Lars showed, and put it in front of the IT equipment. The advantage of that is that it increases pressure in the raised floor, will improve uh, flow distribution through the tiles. It will reduce bypass, and it will force more cold air out, out of the grills, and the perforated tiles. Next, please. So let's take a look at applying that technology uh, in, in the case shown, a cold lock to the, uh, the racks in this room. It's a small room, it's only a thousand square feet with 200 kilowatts of cooling nearly and about 150 kilowatts of load. So there ought to be ample cooling. Next please. So when we take a look at this, uh, we see that actually the room is overcooled which if we're supplying the whole cooling um, could easily be the case. Uh, and, but there's just one cabinet here that's orange compared with the others being blue. Now, uh, I say, said it was overcooled. Ideally, we were aiming for the green range on there, which in uh, Fahrenheit is between about 64 and 81 Fahrenheit. Um, if it's blue, there's, it's cooler than it needs to be. And if it's orange, or even red, then it's warmer than we'd ideally like. The orange range is, range is what the ASHRAE temperature compliance range suggests is an allowable range and meant really for deviation. So for example, if you have a cooling unit failure or something like that. So for short term operation, and that allows air between about 81 and 90 Fahrenheit. Next please. So we'd like to uh, improve the cooling so that that, that warm cabinet gets cooler and then we can raise temperatures to get rid of the overcooled cabinet. The obvious thing to do is to, to, to install uh, cold locks in the floor in these cable penetrations and you can see that they're often largely open. Okay, so putting brushes in there reduces the amount of air leaking through. Next please. So what was our first goal was to increase the uh, pressure in the raised floor by, by preventing the air going through un, unintended par paths. 
And what we can see here is that we've got a, a pressure of about 7 pascals before seals are added and about 12 pascals after seals are added. So that's a, you know, an increase of, of about 80%. Next, please. Well, did it increase the airflow? Before we added seals, we had about 250 to 350 litres per second coming through the tiles. You can see that on the colour. But when we add the seals, the colours are now blue, so more air is coming through the tiles, about 350 to 450 litres per second. That's about a 30% increase. So we've increased the flow through the raised floor. But what did that do for the IT? Next, please. So you'll remember that beforehand in this uh, layout, you can see that one orange cabinet, everything else pretty much cooled or overcooled. Next, please. But when we add the brush seals, things haven't got better. This is a disappointment because it's definitely the right thing to do to manage that lost airflow. But something else is going wrong. Now several of the cabinets are actually above the recommended range. So we need to improve probably the rack airflow management. Next, please. So let's take a look inside the rack. Without any seals, what we can see is that the cold air leaking through the cable penetration is actually passing into the hot side of the cabinet. And it's cooling the airflow in the back of the cabinet down so that that, that warm air, when it reaches the uh, IT, isn't as warm as it was when it came out of the back of the out of the back of the IT. What happened when we installed the cable penetration? Well, this is what happened. Because the cabinet is not well managed, so best practice hasn't been followed in the cabinet, the rack, the hot air in the back of the rack passes around the IT, around the sides of the mounting rails, under the, under the IT equipment, and flows into the front of the IT, producing much higher temperatures because now this air has not been cooled down. Click, please. So what we need to be doing is blanking the gaps. Uh, everybody's aware that you should be, be, be presenting, uh, putting in blanking plates uh, in, in, in between the IT, between the mounting rails, but we must also consider around the mounting rails at the sides, under and over the IT equipment. Next, please. In this case, if we were to go on and seal holes, Sealing the holes in the floor is the good practice, but it's critical to apply the same best practice to the cabinet. And a final engineering simulation image would reveal the optimized cooling with no exhaust air recirculation. Next, please. People often overlook just how important the, the, the configuration of the cabinet is. So this is just a simple example to show you what might happen just reconfiguring the way the IT is installed in the cabinet. In this case, we have uh, a blade center system with uh, three traditional 1U pizza boxes mounted on top. Does it matter whether this way up? Let's have a look at the, the simulation with, with this configuration. Next, please. So what we see here is that underneath the cabinet is not blank. So best practice hasn't been installed. And the hot air is recirculating under the IT. And we're actually getting the temperatures which are only in the allowable range, not in the recommended range. So those highest temperatures for the bottom server are just above 80C, about 80, 81F, sorry. Next, please. Had we installed those the other way around, then the situation is markedly different. The recirculation is still there, but just the configuration of the IT equipment has resulted in a substantial fall in recirculated temperature. So understanding the configuration of the cabinet is important. So even if we can't get at the bottom of the rack to seal it, we could, we could just think carefully about how we install the IT equipment. Next, please. OK, so of course, common practice nowadays to install our containment. This is a really important feature of airflow management and, again, a best practice. Next, please. Typically, people install contained aisles 
uh, with doors and the roof on, on the uh, aisle. So let's take a look at these two aisles in, in, a, in a simulation. These two rows in a single aisle, I should have said. So in this particular data center, there are rows E and H, and uh, you'll see there's a variety of IT equipment installed. And these are this is a view of the front faces of the two rows that we showed in that aisle containment scenario. Next, please. Click, please. What we see when we look at the temperatures actually going into the IT equipment, sorry, can you go back one, is that that the measured temperatures for the IT shows that we have warmer air going into some of the IT equipment, with colder air going into only some of the equipment. Next, please. Why did this happen? Well, simulation shows us that when we added containment, the airflow changed. So some of the IT equipment did get colder air, but some of it got warmer air because uh, the, the containment didn't balance the flows. It's, it's very common when you've got a, a scenario where there isn't enough flow to a particular contained aisle for full containment to cause some issues. And although the, the more cold air may be supplied to the IT equipment, some of the IT equipment may see warmer air because the recirculation now occurs directly inside from inside the cabinet. And so we see these higher temperatures at the top. For those of you who are interested, uh, the uh, temperatures at the top of the rack here were about 85 Fahrenheit, so that's the allowable range. So in this case, we wouldn't expect anything to fail, but we wouldn't really want equipment to be operating full time in that range. Next, please. Okay, sorry, can you go back one? I missed something. So what I meant to, meant to add here is that when you ha have a shortage of air, one of the things to do is to consider a flexible containment system, such as the aisle lock system, which allows you to choose what parts of the containment to use. And in some cases to allow the, the, the top of the aisle to be partially open or even not add doors, it depends on the system. This is where simulation can help to understand what is the best service, but uh, a modular containment system provides the opportunity to be flexible about how we improve the airflow. Next, please. So another common uh, upgrade is to, is to look at your cooling units and think about uh, changing the way the airflow is supplied. A common practice is to provide EC flat fans, sometimes called plug fans, and they're actually backward curved impellers, which are much more efficient, can be controlled to give us air, variable air volume, so thereby give us the ability to match the cooling supply and the airflow demand of the IT. They have a long life and reduce maintenance, and they are much being more efficient. They can cope with higher pressure drops and have lower noise. Next, please. they're fundamentally different to the traditional centrifugal blowers that are in cooling units. The flow pattern is quite different. Uh, they create a plug when they're installed up inside the cooling unit, but often they're installed uh, dropped down into the raised floor. And this can result in a very different airflow pattern. Next, please. So with traditional blowers, the air comes down out of the cooling unit, hits, hits the solid floor underneath the raised floor, and tends to be distributed largely forwards and to the sides. Um, but if you've got an aisle in front of you, the airflow is being directed towards it. Next. Thank you. When we install uh, the EC fans, then that, that rotational motion results in the airflow going in a very different pattern. This may or may not be a problem in the room. Click, please. But as we can see, it is really different. So what's the impact? Next, please. Let's look at a, 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 a data center. The uh, equipment hall here is about 7,000 square feet. It's uh, 800 kilowatts of cooling capacity, N plus two, and a couple of hundred cabinets. It's a moderately sized data center. What's the impact of changing the cooling units? 
what we see is that the airflow between the centrifugal blurs and the EC flans is somewhat different. The colors on the tiles show high flows in blue and low flows in red. And the most important thing is to see that these are different. We haven't really changed. If the management's good, we haven't changed the total flow into the room. We've just changed where it appears. Next, please. And what that's done is it's changed the amount of available cooling in each of the rows. So beforehand we see this. Next click, please. But afterwards we see the air distribution is completely changed and the highest flows are in different rows. So this isn't necessarily a problem, but it does depend on where your IT equipment is. And if your hottest IT or your most important IT is in the two rows indicated, then there have been substantial losses in cooling capacity delivered to those roads. And now a number of IT pieces of equipment are at risk. Given that, I think I've shown you a number of elements that have given you an idea that airflow really changes how the cooling works. And I'll hand back to Lars. Thank you very much, Mark. So what we can learn is that there's no single answer. There are a lot of vendors out there, um, a lot of people speaking at events around the world and distributing content on the internet that says this is the solution or this is the solution. A lot of people are looking for silver bullets. And I think uh, Julian Kudritsky of the Uptime Institute put it very well, which is that efficiency cannot be purchased. It has to be managed. You can't buy full containment, install it, and affect and expect to have an efficient operation. I've been in a number of computer rooms that had installed full containment. And although IT equipment may or may not have gotten better, uh, in many cases they did not realize the benefits of that improved airflow management. They had not gone and made adjustments at the room level. A lot of rooms that I've been in have installed blanking panels. But again, they didn't go and check in at the room level to see how much they could reduce fan speeds or raise supply temperatures. And uh, all of these elements work together. Uh, the goal of airflow management is to effectively cool, keep the IT equipment happy with the lowest flow rate of conditioned air possible at the warmest possible temperature. And when you can do that, the benefits cascade out throughout the entire infrastructure. Chilled water temperatures can be raised. Free cooling hours can be increased. And the cascading benefits can have a profound impact on PUE, uh, which is directly related, of course, to operating cost. It can also have a profound impact on the capacity of the cooling equipment, being able to install more IT equipment, uh, particularly important for both enterprises as well as co-locations who are trying to sell as uh, much kilowatt usage as possible in a room. Um, so all of these issues need to be considered and, and the four R's of airflow management can be a real helpful way to make sure that each of these areas is being addressed. So. That's the, that's the big picture, and over the next uh, three weeks, we'll go into more detail about different aspects of improving airflow management. But I hope today that you've recognized that good practices, best practices, are, are beneficial and a necessary step towards optimization. But each individual one does not stand on its own. The, the entire system needs to be considered. And also, the value of engineering simulation, commonly referred to as uh, CFD or computational fluid dynamics modeling. Engineering simulation can provide a real helpful uh, view into what the changes are going to uh, mean for your room and how much you can benefit from airflow management uh, improvements. Obviously, for each of these categories, we have developed an extensive line of products 
for the raised floor openings. We have a cold lock line of products to seal all various sorts of openings in the raised floor. To address the rack, we have the hot lock family of products and uh, numerous different ways to seal the different openings at the face of IT equipment. And then, as Mark mentioned, uh, when looking at the row level, we have the ILOC um, modular containment uh, family of products and the modular containment. And each of these becomes a really important aspect of improving your computer room. So we're going to cover a couple more of these topics. Here's the uh, agenda for the rest of the month. And now I uh, hope you've been taking some notes and, and you'd like to ask us a few questions. Uh, we'll open it up now for any questions you might have. We'll just take a moment to uh, look and see what comes up. Okay, uh, this is Nick again. Thank you both for the presentation. Um, looks like we are um, getting a couple of questions in here now. First one I'm going to ask you about, um, someone wants to know how they can get the most bang for their buck when making airflow management improvements. Where is really the best place to start? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The most bang for the buck is the free things. And one of the, the easiest ways to improve airflow management and it will cost little or nothing to do it, is to make sure that perforated tile placement is perfect. That every single perforated tile in the room is in the right location. Uh, and that includes making sure that you have the right number of perforated tiles in the cold aisles. Two full rows of supply tiles in a cold aisle is not always the right answer. And there should never be a supply tile in a hot aisle unless, for some reason, there's some piece of equipment that has an intake from the hot aisle side. Um, another question that came up is uh, can I, can I? Curtains, curtains versus containment. And Before you move on, Lars, can I just uh, add a comment to the last question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's worth uh, just adding that uh, the best bang for the buck uh, it's often it, it's often very effective to think about the, the rack and the cabinet first because it's very hard to solve problems inside the rack by improving the room. So if the rack's not well configured, making the room as good as you like won't, won't, won't sort it out. So um, never ignore what's going on inside the rack. In our experience, we see as many problems inside the rack as we do in the room. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up, Mark. That's a, that's a really good point. Uh, a lot of problems have resulted at the, at the rack level due to poor rack airflow management. And the way people address it is by either adding more cooling units, increasing fan speeds, or reducing the supply temperature, reducing the thermostat control on the cooling units, whether it's supply or return control, doesn't matter. Um, the other way that that can be said is that because rack airflow management is not as good as it could be, then fan speeds uh, can't be lowered any further and supply temperatures can't be raised any further. So people may have made an effort to improve things and they might, have, they might already have variable speeds or they've done retrofits for variable speed drives on their cooling units and say they were able to reduce the fan speed down to 80%. And below 80%, they started having intake temperature problems. So they stopped at 80%. Well, that's great. They got a lot of savings. But if rack airflow management and then later raised floor airflow management were improved, they may be able to reduce the fan speeds further, 70 65%. Who knows? So that's a very good point. Um, and then just one more point on, on bang for the buck, which is doors get you a lot of bang for the buck. Usually uh, intake temperature problems are near the ends of the row, and so putting doors on the ends of the aisle can, can really have a lot of benefit. 
We've got a number of other questions coming in. Yes, Nick? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify to everyone that if you'd like to ask a question um, on the GoToWebinar Manager on the right side of your screen, there should be a box to type in your question. So we have a few more that have come in, but if you still um, would like to ask, we have we have time left. So the next question we'll address, um, Lars, if you want to take it, how can you can you talk about curtains versus other containment systems? Uh, yeah, certainly. So curtains have become very popular. Um, they as far as just a pure airflow management perspective, they can be effective, but they have a lot of downsides. Um, they require construction to install. Uh, the regulations on the fire codes have changed, and a lot of curtains were installed with drop-away features with uh, fusible links that melted at temperature so that the curtains got out of the way of the suppression system. That is no longer acceptable. Um, any containment, any full containment that obstructs the fire suppression system needs to be tied into the smoke detection and therefore get out of the way upon smoke detection. Uh, it can, it's no longer acceptable for systems to uh, drop away from heat or some other means like that. So. Uh, a number of other issues with curtains is uh, they tend to yellow over time uh, and become more unsightly. Aesthetics can be a really important issue in some rooms. Another important one is that um, they off-gas. Uh, I've heard of a couple of people that had installed cur curtains and because of the outgassing of that flexible uh, material, they removed them all from the room because they just couldn't uh, work in the room with that much outgassing. Uh, looking at a couple more questions here, um, I have a 1,700 square foot raised floor room with 32 racks, 52 kilowatts of load, and two 10 ton units, and a 15 ton unit, I believe it says, uh, overhead. Um, and the question is, would these units be opposing each other by having underflow uh, flow fighting against overhead flow? Uh, really interesting question. Um, there is the potential for cooling units to fight against each other regardless of the configuration. And if there's overhead and underfloor supply, then the likelihood is increasing. And so you are definitely on to something that is valuable to pay attention to. It's really hard, um, it's, it's pretty much impossible for me to give you guidance on, on how to look at this, um, how to address this without more information about your room. Um, but that is definitely something you can be aware of. The good news is it can be managed. It's possible to have both supply from under floor and above and have that be efficiently done um, and have those units not fighting each other. It, it is possible, and it requires airflow management uh, to prevent circulation of air that you don't want to occur, and uh, good monitoring and controls. But it, it can be done, and if you'd like to discuss that further, uh, I, I welcome that conversation offline. One, one uh, thing that's the, worth adding. Yeah, go ahead. One thing that's worth adding, if, if they're currently return temperature controlled, um, then switching to supply temperature control often helps because at least then there's not a mix of temperatures in the floor going to different cabinets. Uh, and the air from one unit doesn't necessarily return to the same unit. Um, quite a few supply vendors supply, um, supply kits to change the units. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Mark. Um, that also is really valuable when cooling units are um, on opposing walls and the flow patterns can get quite mixed and, and very weird. Um, changing to supply evens everything out. But it does require a little closer management of, of how many cooling units are running. Um, let's see, what is the ideal rack differential pressure inlet outlet in a 100% air cooled data center, uh, assuming a 20 degree delta T of the IT equipment. Um, so 
that again, that this is another fairly complex question. I don't know that I have an answer for you for the uh, ideal differential. Um, I, well, actually, yeah, I mean, the ideal differential in pressure is, is zero, that there is no pressure for the IT equipment fans to push against or to draw from. So ideally, you want there to be no pressure difference from the face of the IT equipment to the back of the IT equipment, so that there's nothing that the, the IT equipment fans have to work against. So another another note to add, add to that. So so when when wouldn't you have zero pressure? Well, you normally if you've got a contained system, you'd normally try and create a slightly positive pressure across the IT equipment to prevent uh, hot air recirculation. What pressure entirely depends on how well managed you are. So how well you have followed best practice and uh, blanked all the gaps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The bigger the gaps, the larger the positive pressure you'll require to protect your IT. Yeah, and uh, just playing off what you said, Mark, um, what often happens is people put in containment and they don't adjust the amount of air delivered to the cold aisle if they're doing cold full cold aisle containment, and so they end up with a excessively high pressurized cold aisle compared to the hot aisle and they may think that that's improved airflow management. The intake temperatures to the IT equipment might all be good, but there's still bypass airflow. There's excess air being pushed through the IT equipment uh, and being wasted. Uh, so another opportunity for improvement there. Yeah, and potentially um, more energy lost, Lars, by it because of the uh, wasted fan energy doing all that excess work. Right. The uh, question is, what is the industry accepted percentage of air leakage uh, per design? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, I think you might be getting at the, what is the accepted amount of bypass airflow, how much excess cooling is uh, acceptable. Um, that, again, the goal is to have as little as possible, but for simplification and uh, ex explanation purposes, say you have a room that requires 10 cooling units to support the load. So say you have uh, cooling units that can re remove 100 kilowatts of heat and you've got a megawatt of cooling, so that requires 10 uh, 100 kilowatt units. You would probably have two extra cooling units um, or 20 percent extra capacity you could get that lower with more refined controls and monitoring. Um, in many cases, we see that number two or even three times uh, excess capacity, not, not 20 or 30 percent, but 200 or 300 percent over capacity. It, it, it's worth noting that um, in legacy installations which are not well managed, um, people actually uh, can't install to uh, more than, say, 60 or 70 percent of their design capacity. So that's when you see people with a lot of excess capacity installed just to try and get the load that they intended in the data center. Um, with good exactly. management, you can get that up to, um, you know, 90 percent, 95 percent plus. Uh, another question here is, what is uh, our position on the use of turning vanes? Uh, turning vanes are often placed underneath uh, crack units. Um, I've seen those used quite often with uh, regular centrifugal uh, blowers, and what they do is they just direct all the air forward and, and prevent it from going straight down and bouncing off of the floor. There's a number of issues here that are at play. Um, the most significant one is raised floor height. The higher the raised floor, the less of an issue this is because there's more room for that air to spread out as it comes out of the cooling unit. Another issue is the amount of blockage underneath the raised floor in the near vicinity. Um, and then in general, I'd answer the question by saying that turning vanes are often treating uh, the symptom and not the cause. 
So I see uh, diverters under the raised floor. These are not necessarily turning vanes, but this um, might be something you're getting at, is that there's diverters placed under the floor to push the cold air into various areas of the room. And why that's treating the symptom and not the cause is that in a lot of those rooms, if they improved the open area management of the raised floor, made a very uh, concerted effort to seal cable openings and um, properly place perforated tiles, that the static pressure under the raised floor would come up enough that they would get enough air out of all of the locations that they need the air out of. Uh, as far as turning vanes specifically being used with EC fans, I've not seen those two being used to, uh, together. Mark, is that something you have any experience with? Uh, no, I haven't seen turning vanes used with uh, backward curved impellers at all, but I would say that in my experience, I haven't seen really a good case for turning vanes. Uh, generally, what you're trying to do is generate static pressure in the raised floor, but um, the velocity out of the cooling unit um, provides stagnation pressure, that's velocity pressure, and this can cause problems in the plenum if the air is rushing past the tile, it can suck air down or make it difficult for the air to turn up through the tiles, and adding turning vanes tends to do that, create strong jets and then in between recirculations, which create very low pressures, and if there's a tile above it, you get downflow through the tile. This is not, not good news. Um, so right. my personal exactly. experience is, is, is um, turning vanes are not a good idea. Letting the air hit the floor from a centrifugal blower and spread out is normally better. Um, if you really have distribution problems, one approach is to add perforated plates around the perimeter between the cooling units and the uh, IT and the, the perforated tiles, but of course this has an energy penalty because there's some additional fan work to blow the air through, but if you get better cooling distribution, it may, may mean you can deliver less air, so you may still be better off. When we've had distribution problems, that has been something that's occasionally been applied to resolve the situation. Probably better than yeah. trying to direct the airflow. Right. Um. Uh, just, uh, I'll add something to that, um, but before I do, uh, Luciano, uh, I don't quite understand your question, uh, so rather than guessing at it, if you could take another try at uh, clarifying or asking in a slightly different way, I'll do my best to answer your question. Um, uh, we have another question about uh, placement of cooling units, and if they are um, placed on opposite walls, what's, what's the best way? Well, one of the challenges is that, you know, cooling unit placement is not something we often have very much control over um, unless we're designing a building, uh, uh, a new room from scratch or a substantial retrofit, or maybe we're adding one additional cooling unit and we want to know where the best place is for it. So. All that being said, it's best if cooling units can be on opposite walls, opposite sides of the room, and not on adjacent walls. And when they're on opposite walls, it's best if they are facing each other and not staggered. The, the, you want to prevent as much uh, swirling or vortexes under the raised floor as possible. Uh, it's pretty hard to uh, control that. Uh, again, we come back to engineering simulation. You know, w that's one of the really valuable uses of uh, modeling airflow in a computer room is to look at uh, what's going to happen with the flow under the raised floor when we add a cooling unit and where's the best place to add it. That can easily be done through through modeling, and uh, and a lot of valuable information can be uh, discovered from that. In general. I want to share a context that there's a huge misconception that once the air goes under the floor, it's, it's all mixed up, and you get this uniform uh, pool of air under the floor, and that's not the case. Each cooling unit has its unique, its own distinct plume of influence, and so the air from one cooling unit generally doesn't mix with the cooling unit's adjacent to it. The pattern that of those uh, plumes can be 
fairly complex uh, and can be very simple if the room is very, uh, very simple and uniform. Uh, but the air doesn't mix. The air goes out and occupies a certain area of the room. Uh, yeah, can I just add a comment? Uh, so yeah, um, often the rule that people quote is that the uh, cooling units should be aligned with the hot aisle rather than the cold aisle. Now in an open room that was uh, proposed really because when they're aligned with the hot aisle they're more likely to draw back hot air and prevent bypass of cold air. So if they're aligned with the cold aisle, uh, cold air can easily travel back to the cooling units and perhaps worse still, the fast flow from the cooling units along the floor underneath is right beneath the tiles so more likely to pull cold, hot air, warm air back down into the void. Uh, so those were the rules, but now we're in a contained scenario, uh, it's less of an issue because now we don't have this uh, bypass route, this easy bypass route open to the return to the cooling unit. So perhaps placement is not as important as it used to be, but and, and we're just restricted to looking at the issues Lars talked about, so the distribution of cold air and recirculations and things under the floor in, in a modern contained scenario. Right, right. Um, here's a specific question from John asking about the placement of some disc arrays four feet from air handling units and uh, not being able to put a, a vent tile there that close to the unit. Um, there are various ways to get around that, uh, John. You can, uh, you can disrupt the airflow under the raised floor, as Mark mentioned. If you have real high velocity close to the cooling units, um, the problem is that it either is low static pressure or even negative static pressure and can suck air from above the raised floor down into the raised floor. So one, one way to address that is break up the airflow, put an obstruction uh, in the airflow path that uh, causes that high velocity um, pressure head to go to static pressure head and that can drive some air up through the tiles. The other is there are tiles available. Triad makes a tile with uh, scoops, basically, on the underside of the tile. And they're real valuable in this particular situation where you have high velocity air, uh, very directional air. And you can place these tiles with these underfloor scoops uh, that can, in some cases, capture that, that high velocity air and, 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 it, and direct it up out of the floor. Uh, another question about static pressure. Uh, what would be uh, what static pressure between the raised floor uh, and above the floor should we shoot for? And I guess I'd answer that by simply saying as, as low as possible to get the job done. Everything everything is done in the room is dependent on the intake temperatures to the IT equipment and. Uh, if you can reduce fan speeds without causing problems for intake temperatures, then the static pressure is lower uh, and the fans are working, doing less work and consuming less energy, um, but you're still effectively cooling the room. So effectively cooling the IT equipment. So the process is um, to improve the open area management of the raised floor as much as possible, and that's going to increase the static pressure as, as Mark's slides showed. And then you can reduce fan speeds and bring the pressure back down. As, and again, the goal is to have it as low as possible, to have the lowest total flow rate of air moving through the room as possible, and uh, still be taking care of IT equipment intake air temperatures. Oh, I hope yeah, I answered your question on that. If you have a follow-up, uh, yeah, please. It's worth, and Mark, it's, worth noting, it's worth noting, Lars, that in the example I showed, we raised the pressure, but it didn't solve any problems. So commonly, if you have got recirculation paths underneath the rack, high velocities up in front of the rack are going to suck even more warm air underneath. So increasing the flow rate through the tiles won't necessarily help. We just need to do what Lars said, which is make sure there's enough air to cool the IT equipment in the rack. So we want it to just reach the top of the rack and no more really. Um, so that's, as, as Lars said, getting it as low as you can 
but still enough to reach all the equipment. Um, that will tend to reduce entrainment due to the jets from the floor tiles. Yeah, um, great point, Mark. Uh, neither of us had, had touched on that during the call so far. Um, yeah, an another uh, addition. Quite often. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say another comment that's worth adding is that exactly the same sorts of principles occur when you start using sidewall ventilation. You don't really want high velocities because that could affect distribution, um, but you obviously need enough air to get all the way across the room. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, the, the only tools really necessary for optimizing a airflow in a computer room are a piece of paper and an infrared thermometer. And with those two, it's possible to make adjustments to optimize everything in the room, given the amount of airflow management that's in there right now. Adjusting tiles, changing set points, all of that can be done with those two very simple tools. The piece of paper is just to help identify which way air is moving and identify problems. And the infrared thermometer, or more ideally an infrared camera, is to be able to determine what the temperatures are in various areas in the room. And one of, related to our last, con our, our topic we were just discussing of uh, high velocity air coming out of supply tiles and blowing right past the IT equipment and pulling hot air from the back of the equipment into the front of the equipment, is that an infrared thermometer or camera can be used and, and pointed at the ceiling of the room. And if you look at the ceilings above cold aisles, and find that they're significantly colder than the ceilings in other areas of the room, it's very likely that there's too much air coming out of the tiles in the cold aisle and going right past the IT equipment and hitting and cooling off the ceiling. So an infrared thermometer or camera is, is a really useful tool to find out what's going on in the room. Okay. Thank you, Lars and Mark, for the presentation for the questions. We're at the top of the hour now, and that um, was the last question. So thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. Uh, later, you will be sent a link to view the webinar recording if you would like, and we will also be posting these slides on SlideShare to send. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to email Lars or Mark directly as their email addresses are there, or you can contact me at marketing at upsite.com. Thank you again. Bye-bye.